Hi, my name is Deep and my colleague Hi, my name is Deep and my colleague Alex and me will be talking about ZStore, which is a columnar store that we've built for Postgres. We both work at VMware and on the Greenplum database server team. So let's get acquainted with the agenda for today. We'll be setting goals and expectations for ZStore and column stores in general to begin with. Then we'll talk about ZStore's design and we'll compare and contrast with the design of Heap, which is Postgres's row store. Uh, we'll talk about how ZStore is benchmarked, show you some performance numbers, and then we'll tell you uh, what the open areas of work we have for ZStore, and we'll show you how to get involved with the project. So let's lay down some expectations for a column store in general. Um, whenever you think about a column store in database land, you usually refer to laying out the data for a column physically on disk together. So you expect that there'll be a high degree of spatial locality for data belonging to the same column um, because of the layout. And what this means is that that kind of data is much more compressible than the data if you store it row wise. So whenever you think column store, you typically always think about compressibility. Column stores in general handle OLAP style workloads, meaning you're projecting a few columns and selecting a lot of data out um, much better than the OLTP style workload where you're just probably uh, up, you're doing updates and deletes or you're querying on, a, on the entire row or you just want one row out of the database and there are many transactions. That is a case that column store doesn't really handle well, but for the other OLAP style, it should do well. And because, because fetching a single or few of the columns uh, takes much less uh, number of disk pages to be brought out of a disk, uh, that means that index builds will al also be faster and your selects would also be faster. Um, so those are some, some of the generic expectations. More specific ones for ZStore would be every Postgres user can use it. Um, this is something that has been in the, discussed in the Postgres community for a long time, that Postgres doesn't have a column store and we need one, and it's demanded by enterprise customers. We want ZStore to be optimized for OLAP workloads. At the same time, we want it to be performed reasonably well for OLTP style workloads and maintain feature parity with the heap uh, storage layer that you get out of the box with Postgres. Um, this is motivated from what we've seen with Greenplum customers. Greenplum has its own column oriented storage and customers were initially satisfied with no updates or no deletes on the columnar tables, but soon they wanted updates and deletes and modifications. So that's something we keep in mind. Um, we want full MVCC support for visibility and transaction isolation, as well as crash safety. We also want to be able to automatically absorb improvements to Postgres, uh, to Postgres, any part of Postgres that doesn't involve ZStore. And the way we get to that is with the, with the fact that ZStore is an implementation of the Postgres table access method API, which allows you to plug your own, um, plug your own storage layer, essentially. Now, keeping it a strict implementation means that we can benefit from other uh, improvements to Postgres without having to change ZStore's code. At the same time, we want to be able to contribute to the table AM API, make it better while we are developing ZStore. That's a nice side goal. Um, now let's talk about ZStore's design. So overall, we'll be discussing where the table access method API sits in the, in the Postgres layers. We'll be talking about the unique B2-based architecture for ZStore. Um, what the file layout looks like, how we do compression, and then finally 
finish things off with a single row insert example and a single row select example. So there will be some jargon that we might be using very often. A tuple is a row, an attribute is a column, a block in Postgres is a page in Postgres is uh, eight KB unit uh, for that it's eight K in Linux, then Linux kernel will be 4K, but here it's 8K by default. You can configure it, but it's usually still 8K. Then visibility and MVCC basically dictates whether a row is visible or not to another transaction. And we store this kind of information in undo pages in ZStore. Um, finally, a datum refers to a single value of a column, and we'd be referring to that quite often. So let's talk about Postgres's layers and where the table access method fits in to Postgres's backend. So you can see that it lies between the query planner, query executor, which handles DML and select queries and the table commands interface, which handles DDL and the buffer manager, which handles the shared buffers, um, which basically buffers in main memory, uh, this on disk pages that represent, that pertain to the relation. So um, we see that the A access method API and manager lies just in between. And these are some of the implementations. Heap is the default row store for Postgres. This is ZStore, this is us. And we both, both Heap and ZStore go through the buffer manager. This means we can uh, utilize uh, all of the code responsible for Postgres's buffer management, um, like buffer misses, hits, things like that. Um, eviction policies and whatnot. There's a lot of code there that we can leverage. Um, buffer manager uh, delegates to the storage manager, pulls stuff out of the disk and uh, page cache, uh, and all of that we can leverage. If you want to implement your own access method, you can you can opt not to go through the buffer manager. You can uh, if this could this toy AM could be an in-memory AM, for example. Um, that's completely up to the implementer, but we opt to use the buffer manager because this has a lot of benefits for observability and things like that. Um, so, which means ZStore tables look and feel the same uh, as heap tables to a database administrator or user. So these are, this is, these are kind of the methods that are involved with um, implementing a table AM API in Postgres. The only requirement you can implement any subset of these methods. So if your table AM doesn't want to support deletes and updates, don't implement these methods. Um, all of these methods do depend on one little thing, which is that every tuple should have a tuple identifier. And we will be going into detail about the tuple identifier very soon for ZStore. But this is the only rec big strict requirement really. So um, this is a link to a toy access method, which is basically a stopped version of an act, the entire access manager access method API. And it's a great starting point to see what an access method really looks like. With that, I'll let Alex cover ZStore's internal design. Right. Hi, I'm Alex. And right, I'm going to talk about the internal designs of ZStore. So this diagram is a diagram or the kind of diagram that you would probably see whenever someone talks about real store and column store. So I put one here as well because of peer pressure. But keep in mind that this is a abstract view and the actual implementations of a row store or a column store could look different from this. And now let me give you the Z store implementation. So you can think of a Z store table or that sort of relation as a forest of bee trees, where each tree represents a column or maybe a column family that consists of multiple columns. And within each tree, each node represents a 8K block that we just talked about before for Postgres. So in this third one, attribute tree at number one stores all the data from column one attribute tree at number two stores all the data for column two and so on. So all of the B trees are indexed by a 48-bit integer called ZStore tuple ID or simply TID. As its name indicates, it unique, uniquely identifies a tuple. 
a tuple's TID never changes, and a tuple can be moved around within a block or even between blocks. You may notice that there is a special tree called TID tree. Um, instead of storing the actual user data, it stores the visibility information of all the tuples. Visibility information means something like transaction IDs um, of a tuple when it was inserted or deleted, and also the operations can be done to undo when a transaction is committed or abort. So I wanted to talk about the benefit of this design. First of all, um, B-Tray is a fast and versatile data structure. Um, in the Postgres world and other databases, we have already used it widely for indexes. So we think it would be really cool to leverage the same data structure as a column store. It is nice, um, for example, um, given a tuple ID, you can, you can descend the tree and quickly locate the block that stores that tuple. Also, by having a logical tuple ID, um, we can move tuples around easily when we insert new data or when we do compression or split pages. Whereas for the traditional heap table, the TID is tied to a physical location of the tuple. Um, another feature of that store is that we, or design decision we've made is to leverage the 8K block. That way it's really easy for us to manage, but it requires the um, compression algorithm to be able to compress data into a certain size. For our case, right now we support LZ4 algorithm and it works pretty well for us so far. And lastly, by having a separate TID tree, it um, separates the metadata for visibility information from the actual user data, which is also nice. So bear with me, I'm going to do a quick refresher for B-trace since we're talking about B-trace. So let's take this example of creating a table full using ZStore with two columns I and J, and we insert 30K rows. And with this nice function, we can see all the blocks that belongs to attribute number J, attribute J. So as you can see, it has four blocks. Block nine is the root block. It covers the low key of TID one to the, uh, it is it's inclusive until the exclusive high key of the maximum TID. And it stores the down links to its children, blocks six, eight, and 12. Um, each stores the actual datum of the TIDs or tuples it covers. And each of the leaf block has a next pointer to the next blocks. Now let's look at all the blocks we have within table foods relation file. Um, the left side is demonstrates the relations between each of the blocks and the right side sorted all of the blocks by the, bl the block numbers. As you can see, the majority of the blocks are B-tree blocks, either for the attribute tree or for the TID tree. And there is a special block called or page called meta page. It's always block number zero. It stores the pointer to the root blocks of each attribute tree. And from the TID tree, it stores pointers to a undo page. Undo page stores the actual visibility information. And then if you have oversized item, then you may have a pointer stored in the attribute leaf page that points to a toast page where the payload of the oversized datum um, are stored. Um, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides, but it's not important at the moment. Um, one important thing I wanted to note here is that the block numbers are the numbers the buffer manager uh, gives us. So two consecutive block numbers means 
the two blocks comes from two consecutive requests from the buffer manager through the storage manager to the operating system. It is not guaranteed that two consecutive blocks are actually physically consecutive to each other on the file system, but that's the best we can hope. Now let's zoom in and look at what we saw on a page. So this is the generic, the layout of a generic Postgres block or page. It applies to, it is designed originally for heap table and it is also applied to other access method um, or indexes, for example, like gene index or just index, et cetera. As we can see, in the beginning of the page, we store a header, and I pasted the struct of the, the header and also the link for the code there and documentation, so you can check them out if you're interested. But the interesting things for us are PD lower, PD upper, PD special. Um, PD line pointer is important for heap table, but not for ZSOR. Um, we'll also talk about that. So let's think of this as a heap table page for now. Between the page header and PG lower, we store item pointers to the actual items. And then between PD upper and PD special, we store the actual tuple items. So as we insert new data into the page, PD lower will grow downwards and PD upper will grow upwards. And finally, between PD special and the end of the page is a special area for access methods. You can store whatever you want for your access methods there. Now, moving on, let's look at the layout for a TID lead page. As you can see, the layout is actually exactly the same as the heap pages layout, except for the item we store. Um, instead, of, instead of storing tuples, we store a thing called ZSTID array item. I'm not going to dive into the details of this item or the struct of this item, um, but the gist is that what we store in them um, logically is just a set of TIDs and their corresponding undo pointers. The undo pointer could be either an actual pointer to an undo page. Um, it also could be two special pointers. It could be either, either for a pointer that marks this tuple as visible to all the transactions, or it marks this tuple as invisible, invisible to all the transactions. The physical content of the item are more compact than the logical con content. As you can see, we do delta encoding for the TIDs, and we also uh, have done some hack to make the undo pointers more compact. Now, moving on to a attribute leaf page layout. The attribute leaf page looks slightly different from the heap page or the TID leaf page. So between the header and PD lower, um, and also between the upper and special, instead of storing item pointers or items, we store this structure called ZS add stream. It could be either in compressed format as the upper stream or in uncompressed format in the lower stream. So let's, for now, let's just focus on the lower stream and see um, what are the chunks we store there. So within each chunk, um, the structure is very similar to what we saw for the I, um, TID array items where we store a set, a set of TIDs, but instead of undo pointers, we store the actual column data there um, within each chunk. And again, the physical, con the physical content is more compact because we've done some special encodings there. And I want to briefly talk about toast. Toast in the Postgres world stands for the oversized attribute storage technique. It's also known as the best thing since sliced bread. Um, it's actually written in the Postgres documentation. I'm not lying, 
Um, anyways, whenever you are going to write a oversized datum, aka when your datum is greater than 8K, then the first thing we try is to compress this datum using the Postgres default compression algorithm called PGLZ. And after doing compression on that, if the compressed datum can fit into the ad stream or the page, then we just write that directly into the chunk. Otherwise, we would need to allocate a post page or a set of post page, and then we write oversized, oversized datum there and then store the pointer in the chunk to the first post page of this datum. Now, you may wonder why do we need to store two streams on a page? Here's why. Um, whenever we insert new datum, we first append, or rather chunks, we first, uh, we first append the chunks to the lower ad stream in the uncompressed format. And as we keep doing insertion, the lower stream will consume more of the free space until it consumes all of the free space. And when that happens, we would un uncompress the upper stream and then merge that with the lower stream and then compress them together as one single upstream again. Um, and hopefully, after that, we would have more free space left on the same page. And as we keep doing this, at some point, this page is gonna be full of upper stream uh, with that um, in compressed format. And when that happens, we would need to allocate a new page. Now we have talked about the overall design of that store and the page layout. Um, now let's um, go through an example of inserting into a uh, insert a single row into table foo. Let's say insert into foo with values hello 42. Now with, with table foo, um, for each of the backends, we have a we maintain a hash table called tuple buffers. And the, the hash table is hashed by, the hash key is the relation ID. So given table full, we could locate the entry for table full, and within each entry, we store TIDs that are maybe pre-reserved for this table, and most importantly, the add buffers of the table. So let's say we do this insertion, and let's say we do not have pre-reserved TID for table full. Then the first thing we need to do is to descend the TID tree and find out what is the first unused TID, and then create some undo record for this transaction or for this tuple, and then um, return the new TID, in this case, TID5, back and then we can use that to write to the add buffers. You may wonder what exactly we store in the add buffer. The add buffer itself has also has two layers of buffering. The first layer is just for just a 60, uh, a, a, some arrays with the size of 60. The arrays are the TIDs and the datums and the is now informations. So, once we have filled up the arrays um, with the new datums, we want to write them to the stream buffers, which is the second layer of buffering that app buffers provides. The stream buffer, you will, is very, it's actually the in-memory representation of the ZS stream we just saw. So it stores the chunks. So whenever we have filled up the, the arrays, we write out the raw datum into the stream buffer, so they're encoded into chunks. And in, whenever we fill up the chunks, um, we, whenever we fill up the, the stream buffers, um, we would need to flush that into 
the shared buffers of the attribute trees. So for insertion, we always only flush the buffers when the buffer is large enough, for example, when it, it reached one megabyte, but for some other operations like doing a new um, select or insertion, we might not wait until that happens. We might flush the buffers sooner than filling, than we fill up the upstream buffer. Anyways, this is how we do single insertion. Now let's move on to sequential scan for column with column for projection. So let's say we do select i and j from table full. So whenever it comes to um, sequential scan with column projection, it's really important for the storage layer to understand what columns it needs to scan. Otherwise, it has to scan all the, if it has to scan all the columns, then there's no difference or no benefit you can get out of the column store. So this is the API that we added for table AM API. So to let the executor pass down the column information that the storage layer may need. Anyways, once we have started sequential scan, the next thing we need to do is to do get next lot. This lot is just a container for a tuple. Don't be confused by the name. Just think of it as a tuple. So when we do get next lot, um, first thing still, we descend the TID tree and get the TID out of the TID tree get the next TID out of the TID tree, in this case five again, because I made up the example and I'm not creative. Anyways, um, with the TID five, we call this attribute fetch function um, and we make this call to each of the attributes that it needs to scan. And then fetch the column data for those attributes. Eventually, we will stitch all the values we got um, together into a whole tuple. So this is how select is done. Now I'm gonna hand this over to Deepakit for performance. All right, let's talk about some performance uh, numbers for ZStore. So in this slide, we look at uh, what the on-disk footprint for ZStore looks like. So on the very left is our um, baseline, which is heap. So for a heap, these tables take so and so many bytes. If you look at ZStore, it'll take, it takes about half of the size, which is a pretty good result. However, this is for when the table is loaded with one copy session. Copy is the command that is available to load data from an external source, such as a CSV file into Postgres. But what happens if you run 16 parallel copies into the same table at the same time? We get a lot of bloat. As you can see, the uh, size has gone, gone up and is now almost equal to heap. This is pretty undesirable, this column. So this, the reason why this bloat happens is because uh, we are doing out of order inserts into the attribute tree um, because of concurrency. And that leads to very inefficient page splits. And you can get more information as to what these splits look like um, but long story short, it's like um, the pages are underutilized as a result of the splits. So a way to mitigate that is to reserve TIDs in batches in the TID reservation for, in, for copies, for copy commands. Um, and we do that in batches of N, which is a configurable uh, number. And as you can see with an increase in N, we see the size requirement go down drastically for these tables and we all we beat heap here with n equals thousand. Um, a side effect of this is that the copy runtime goes down from 100 minutes without with n is one and all the way down to seven minutes as you increase n. And the reason is we reduce contention on the tit tree. And if you reduce contention on the tit tree, it's always a win. Um, in ZStore, everything goes through the tit tree. So, that is what is happening here, uh, as, as that's a neat result. So 
let's talk about some of the monitoring tools that we use uh, often. Uh, one is uh, timing on. It's a psql command. A psql is a command line client for Postgres. Um, if you run any query with timing on, it will give you the full round trip time of the query, which will unfortunately sometimes include the execution time and the time taken to send the tuples over the client connection and also the processing time at the client. So if you want to avoid these two factors and purely look at execution time, you can turn to explain analyze. Now explain analyze is going to give you a very detailed output. It will give you the plan, it will give you It'll give you um, uh, how much time was spent uh, doing input output uh, and things like that. It will only take into account execution. Uh, um, yeah, so it will only take into account execution time and not the, uh, the time taken to send tuples over or the client processing time. There's some timing overhead that can be associated with explain analyze. So that's a gotcha on some systems like FreeBSD on a Google Cloud Platform uh, VM, you would notice that uh, explain analyze takes a lot longer uh, because of the get time of day is called taking too long. So turn to PG test timing. That's a command line utility available with your Postgres installation to test the impact of the overhead from explain analyze. We use explain analyze quite heavily as we will see. So Single column projection is kind of the best case for a column store and we are going to scale test that. We are going to primarily look at on disk performance. So we're going to take one of the TPCDS, which is a very popular analytics benchmark, one of the tables, pretty wide table as you can see. We'll be using LZ4 for compression to get the best results, both in terms of compression ratios and execution time we will be operating on about 100 gigabytes of raw CSV data. We'll be using table spaces to place these tables on SSDs and rotational hard disks to compare the impact of uh, these disks on, on the on-disk performance. Um, we'll be loading data serially and concurrently as you could see with the last two slides, as you could see uh, with the slide a couple of slides back. Um, concurrent copy does have an impact. Um, We'll be using the track IO timing. These are some of the configuration parameters that we use, optimized for data loading. Um, track IO timing, along with explain analyze, buffers timing and verbose will give you the results that you're looking for uh, in this case. Um, we ensure that before every run of an experiment, we have nothing in the database shared buffers and we have nothing in the operating system page cache to begin with, uh, to truly test out uh, on disk performance. So this is what a sample explain analyze output looks like. So it will give you the total execution time of the query without showing the query results, without spamming your screen like crazy if you're selecting a lot of stuff. For example, it will also tell you how many buffers were read. Multiply this number by 8K and you'll get the number of bytes read and the total input output time taken to read these bytes. So this is an example. We use this pretty often. And let's take a look at some numbers. So for a table loaded with 16 parallel copies, we're seeing that the heap table size is around 112 gigabytes, whereas Z store is taking up around 59 gigs. You can see there's a vast difference in the number of bytes read and the number of buffers read. Um, because in Zstore we have to select a lot less number of columns. And that is kind of represent that is kind of reflected in the input output time. Um, we are beating uh, heap here uh, quite well, but not as well as kind of what we expect. Um, because if you look at the ratio between bytes read um, that kind of 112 gigs over 1.4 is not really reflected in 59 over 20. So we'd want this number to be a little less. Um, so that's something we want to strive towards. So this, these results were for SSD. Now let's talk about the results for HDD. On the HDD, we are not seeing the, as good performance as we are seeing on the SSD. In fact, we're being beaten by heap here. Um, if you run IOSTAT, you look at the and you look at the average request read request size. 
uh, you'll see that for heap, it's around 336, whereas for Zetro, it's around eight. This high number usually typically represents a sequential workload. This one represents a low number such as this represents a random workload. Now, where is this randomness coming from? Well, if you're having multiple copy sessions writing into the same uh, table and writing into, they're probably writing into the same attribute tree. So you can see that these uh, numbers are apart. They're not consecutive. Consecutive numbers imply they're close to each other on disk. And the gaps between these numbers can only go up if you have more, um, if you have more concurrent loading happening. So the leaves, the attribute trees leaves are scanned in order. Um, when you're doing a scan on the uh, scan on a column, as Alex was mentioning. So these need to be as sequential. So you will kind of want a picture like this for attribute number tree number two here. Um, HDD, a hard disk definitely suffers more from random reads than in, an NVMe SSD does. So this is something that we have to work around and get, and we'll show you how we fix this. The way to fix it is for every attribute tree, we maintain a free page map and we pre-reserve a list of contiguous blocks. The number of contiguous blocks that we reserve is dictated by this uh, rel option that you can specify when you use the create table statement. And this basically, we use, we term this N for the remainder of this presentation. And with an increase in N, you will see that um, the, the runtime, the input output time doesn't change that much uh, for, for SSD because, and because it's not that important for an SSD. Um, they do random or semi-random reads pretty well, but you'll get the drastic difference in the hard disk. In the hard disk numbers, you can see we've gone down from 133 seconds input output time all the way down to 2.7 seconds. Input output time as a refresher is the amount of time that was taken to, pop to populate the disk pages on bring them into shared buffers. So this is a win-win for us. Uh, if you, on closer inspection, if you run in IOSTAT, you'll see that uh, average read request size improved from 8.01 to 298.90 with our fix. And the, um, the figure that we used was 496 for N or the rel extension factor. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good um, result right there. If you want to look at it deeper, um, there, this is a frequency distribution of the read sizes. Um, and you can see that for heap, most of the reads with the, the average read request size to be 336, most of the reads are um, around 128 to 512K, um, pretty high. If you look at Zstore, all of the reads are with the average request size of eight. All of the reads are actually clustered in this bracket, you can see. Um, so that means that the average request size isn't, isn't that great. Um, and that's something we alleviate if we increase N. Increasing N to 128 kind of allevi alleviates a situation with m more reads of higher length, as you can see. And you can see reads of even higher length when you ramp up N all the way to 4096. You can ramp up N as much as you want. Typically, you want to go as, as high as possible, depending on um, depending on your workload, depending on the amount of data you're copying, depending on the number of concurrent sessions doing the loading. If you don't have any concurrent sessions doing the loading, you don't need to increase N. Um, a discussion is there. Uh, there's a link here um, to the thread that discusses this. Um, so please take a look. Um, this is what happens when uh, th these are some of the results when you're doing a warm run without clearing cache or without clearing the shared buffers. You can see that Zstore outperforms heap just by virtue of the fact that it selects a lot less data. It needs a lot less data to be in memory. If you remember, that's only 1.4 uh, gigabytes. Um, so that easily fits into the shared buffers and gets good performance the second time, third time, fourth time you run your query which is great. 
Um, and this is select star, which is the worst case for a column store. You can see that most more or less um, we do well with an increase in N here as well from 447 seconds to 236 seconds. Um, finally, this is the storage perf test suite. This kind of gives you a holistic view of the many elements such as select, copy, vacuum, delete, uh, update, toasting, inline compression and things like that. Um, it gives you a nice picture of Zetra's performance. All of these numbers are on very small tables, not very large, uh, but significant enough to keep in mind while we develop. So this, this is kind of, we will give you a kind of overview of what Zetra is like. All of these numbers are to be taken with a grain of salt because changing some of the sizes of the tables, you will get different results. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Alex to discuss open areas of work for Setstore. All right, let's move on to the open areas of work for performance. Actually, all of the work are for performance, otherwise we would just use keep table. Before I get started, I wanted to point out that all of these link are links to a discussion on the Postgres hackers mailing list. So check them out if you're interested. Because we have a long list here, I'm just gonna pick a couple of those to talk about. First, let's see, eliminate host flow. Right now, sometimes toast table doesn't have good um, compression ratio in our tests. That's because when you have a oversized item, it may take up two toast pages and the second page sometimes is almost empty. So that leads to bad compression ratio and we want to improve that. And then we want to avoid full table rewrites for alter table column operation, such as add or drop column and set data type because for that store, we don't need to rewrite the entire table for those operations. And today, the table access method API doesn't provide an interface for that. And then we want to make update and delete faster. This is mostly for implementing in-place updates and reuse PIDs. Because when you just want to update one attribute, we want to just patch that one attribute instead of deleting and inserting a new role for every attribute tree. We want to have faster stream decoding because right now um, B tree data structure helps us to locate a tuple to a block quickly. However, once you reach to that block, we also want to have fast access to the tuple within the chunks. Moving on, we want to support column family and even row store. We've talked about that before. We have the infrastructure for it. I want to talk about replace undo with upstream undo framework. So Postgres uses redo for crash recovery and the undo framework aims to provide uh, visibility information, AKA um, MVCC is the term we usually use. It stands for multi-version concurrency control. Um, every access method would need that. Today, um, heap table stores the same information um, together with the data file. But as we are adding more new access methods, we want to abstract that, we want to extract that out from the table access method and have a common framework that provides the same support to all the access methods. So we definitely are going to leverage the Angular framework once it's ready. And then we want to explore more about compression algorithms. Right now we are using LD4. Um, we wanted to do more exploration there. And we wanted to make the query planner aware of the table access methods. For example, we want to, the AM to provide more statistics that's specific to the AM and make the planner make more wise decision based on those statistics. And here's the tools you can play with Zestor. Um, here's the GitHub repo 
and some inspect functions if you are a developer and interested are interested in the internals um, you want you may want to check it out and we have an ansible playbook to do the benchmarking stuff and we have a more lightweight uh, storage curve suite um, for development and this is how we run regression tests for that store and we have this discussion threads going on in the Postgres hackers list. We have a Slack channel in the open source Gwynplum Slack instance. Um, we have Twitter accounts, and here's the blog we have. So um, finally, a big thank you to everyone who has involved in the thread and the development of that store. And we're ready for Q&A. Come talk to us. Okay, we're ready for questions. I'm not yet seeing any questions from the chat, chat or the Slack channel. Our videos are not showing up, but we are all here for questions, Deep and I. We're also going to be, we're going we're gonna to wait here for five minutes. And if you have questions afterwards, we are also there in the Slack channel as well. There is a Slack channel for open source databases. It's called Two Track Open Source Databases. But please paste your questions in, um, paste, I don't know what this is called. Pick our questions while we're here. I can see we have 14 attendees here. Okay, I have, I see a question from Josh. How are you handling cost estimation? Um, right now, we haven't done much yet. We have, uh, we have proposed a few patches to that, the upstream for um, calling specific cost uh, estimations. I have also pasted that thread at the end of the slide. Basically, we need more um, stats for column specific things. Yes, uh, so, so uh, for the question from Josh, um, so we, so right now, Postgres planner isn't aware of uh, the column in nature. So we have, as Alex was mentioning, we have a few um, batches open right now. So to collect that information and to use that information. Um, specifically, like when you do a scan, uh, you're, you're collecting, you're scanning a subset of the pages. So that information is to be made available to planner to really know how many pages are actually being going to be scanned. So that, that's kind of on our radar. Um, so um, for a question from Robert, uh, what index types B3 chest print 
do you see being useful with that store? Um, right now, we do support um, these index types. Um, I think I think uh, there's a bit of a uh, bit of a well, bit of a um, performance regression with Grin. I'm, I don't believe we have tried uh, just indexes, to be honest. But we do uh, we do expect uh, the index types to be fully supported. Um, we definitely do. And I see a question from uh, hold on. I see a question from Cassia. Um, interested in the workflows for this solution. Can you elaborate this question? I I'm not entirely understand what does workflows mean or solution for here. Um, maybe Cassia is talking about um, whether this will be good for OLAP or NTP. Um, we do want it to be good for OLAP workloads, or so analytic workloads um, specifically. Um, and where specifically you have queries that are operating on subset of columns, specifically if you have a wide table, that's, that's great. That's a other high uh, use case. For a column store, um, other, other, uh, other such uh, workflows where we would want it to be useful is some OLTP workloads as well. Um, we do definitely want to support uh, insert, update, delete, and kind of support whatever heap does um, in terms of features. That's what we're striving for. So um, Robert asked a question. It seems like UUID based schema might lead to lots of bloat um, because it can't be backed in order. Um, so the 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 in the um, the tip that we use um, is is an is an in 64, but we use like 48 bits of that. So we are not. I, I'm not sure what you mean by UUID here, but um, we, we, it is like uh, integers, and most often the integers are consecutive, so it, um, it, it's very compressed. Like uh, each did item uh, in the did tree leaves, or even the attribute leaves, we can pack the um, dids together. And it's very pretty compressible. We use delta encoding because most of the time they're consecutive. So we'll uh, continue the discussion on Slack. I'll, uh, we'll echo the questions that were remaining here and uh, continue on Slack. Thank you very much. Thank you.